This proof illustrates the wedge in rule. If we start at the top, we'll notice that lines 1, 2, and 3, there's nothing that we can do. Line 4, we can break it up by ampersand out. So put R and N for ampersand out done twice. At this point, there is something that we can do at the top, but this, this proof will be more interesting and more informative if I pretend that I'm stuck at the top right now and instead I run off to the bottom. So I'm going to pretend that I'm stuck at the top and I go to the bottom and I see the arrow is the main connective. Okay, well that means I'm supposed to make a box for arrow in. I'll try to make it kind of nice and neat, although it's never easy. Writing freehand on this screen. Eh, not too bad. Okay, S at the top of the box. M ampersand N wedge D at the bottom of the box. That's line 7, and this is a provisional assumption for arrow in. Alright, at this point I go back up to the top and let's see if I can work on anything. When I look at line 1, I know that it says if I could find R and S then I could write H arrow G. And so I am inspired to go look for R and S and I find them both and I can put this together and say R ampersand S by 5, 6 ampersand N. Where did this R and S come from? It did not come out of line 1. Line 1 was merely the inspiration to build it. Of course, this was a creative rule, and you shouldn't do creative rules unless you know why you're doing it, but I do know why, because I wanted to do the arrow out. And so now I get H arrow G by 1, 8 arrow out. Now, having done that, I can check off line 1. And then I look at line 2, and now I am inspired to try to build R wedge S. I go and look and I don't have R wedge S, but I can build it if I have one half or the other. And notice I actually have both halves. On line 10, I'm going to write R wedge S. But notice I want to say either 5 wedge in or 7 wedge in. If I write 5 comma 7 over here, well, that's really a small mistake because when you're doing wedge in, you're only working with one half or the other and you're pulling the other part out of the out of thin air. So I'm going to go ahead here and say 5 wedge in. The truth is I could have done this wedge in even before I set up this box but I kind of wanted to make the point that when you have two pieces of the wedge like you do in this case you don't want to use both you want to use just one or the other. Well, once again, I've done a creative rule. I know exactly why I did it. It's so that I could do arrow out, and on line 11, I could write G arrow H. And so that, of course, is 210 arrow out. And now I'll check off line 2. Well, I get to line 3, and I said if I have G double arrow H, I can write M. Do I have G double arrow H? I don't, but I'm inspired to try to build it. And double arrow in requires that I have two single arrows, and notice here we have the right relationship. The G's and the H's align perfectly, so on line 10, 12, I can put them together and get G double arrow H by 9, 11, double arrow in. Notice that in this proof I did ampersand in, wedge in, and double arrow in. I've used all three of my creative rules and I did it for the same purposes, to build the antecedent of these three conditionals so that I could do arrow out. Well, I still need to do this last arrow out and so I get to write M on line 13 and that of course will be 312 arrow out. But notice what I've got now. My current goal is to build M and N wedge D. Well, if I had a D, I could just wedge in this other stuff, but I don't. 
But notice now I have an M and an N. So I can put together M ampersand N by 6, 13 ampersand N. And then from that I can wedge in. And I'll just say 14 wedge in. Pull that D out of thin air. And I'm done. On line 16, the justification will be 7 through 15, arrow in. And that's it.